Sorry about that. Welcome to So as I told you, 
the tour we are doing is, or we have to do it in 5 hours and 30 minutes, and um, we will take us around 1 hour to get from here to the archaeological site. The archaeological site, we have around 1 hour and 10 minutes to be walking, exploring, taking pictures, and
counters. Man. Hunters. 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 Where are other hunters? We're missing a couple. There they are. Perfect. Okay. So well, what we are going to do, I will describe about this, but what we are going to do before to describe it is explore a little bit by your own. You can climb to the steps <coughs> if you want, just to the rope, just in case that you would like a picture. Be careful, just check what your step, because we could find fire ants in some areas, and even the land is not totally flat. And just the land is a little bit like this. We have some small elevations. So after in some eight minutes, we're gonna be meeting by the left side somewhere. So I'm gonna be calling you as hunters to explain you about this and to give you information. Do you agree? Yes. Yep. Good. Perfect. Yep. So let's do pictures. Pictures. Time. Pictures. Walk under that tree, Kim, and see if you can see it. Let's see. You can just all say that. And open your mouth and all. And the meaning, the meaning of Jack Jobin is place of the red corn. Place of the red corn. So that's why, what happened here? What is the history of this place? Even I mentioned before, and for the people that are just joining us, Mayas were split among five countries. Five countries that made this civilization. We talk about Southern Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras and Salvador, the north part of the Salvador. So that's why the word Mayas, we use it only to talk about people that lived among these five countries before 1600 AD. People nowadays, we are Mayan descendants. I am a Mayan descendant. So that's why we are specifically known as Mestizos. Well, what happened here? This archaeological site, the Mexican authorities known that it exists in the year 1972. Okay? Because before we had people, before the 70s, there were people doing illegal excavation. <laughs> no restoration. Excavation is something, and restoration is different. 
so illegal excavation. It means that before all these buildings, before they were restored, these buildings looks as a mount you could see in front of you. That mount shows something as a building that used to be a building before. Okay? So that's why once the people that came from other different countries to Mexico, they found these buildings and as they had evidences that before, in the central part of Mexico, when we had another civilization known as Aztecs were living, they known that these buildings in the Aztec cities had gold, specifically gold. And this is what these people tried to, found, to find here. Doing illegal excavations, removing all these rocks, because they thought that these buildings were similar than Aztecs, with chambers, rooms, and something like that. And what they found is that these were completely solid. Just a bunch of rocks, but something that they found, they found something, they found some little things. Little figurines made with clay, plates, cups, you know, vessels. So all this was possible to find and could be used to use it or sell it in black markets. So that's why they had to be planning or forming a project to do restoration in some buildings for protection of them. So finally, if we come here and we find a building as this that could be totally ruined, this is one building that is completely 100% damaged. But to restore it, first we could know or we need to know what is the shape of the building. What is the form it has? Because when we walk through those ruins, we never we're gonna find all the buildings keeping the same shape. First, if we look back that one, you're gonna see that standing from this angle, the shape it has is similar as a pyramid. Similar as a pyramid. But if you're surrounded by the other side same shape. It looks as a pyramid. But this one, standing exactly where we are, looks as a pyramid. A little bit deformed, right? But if we're surrounded by the other side, we're going to see that miss that form. And the form it has is large. It's large. So that's why then there is another way to take pictures. Air. Air pictures, you will see different geometrical forms of them. These buildings, these buildings look as a square. These buildings as rectangles. And that's why, what was the purpose? The difference. We are talking about residences and temples. But, when we talk about these different buildings, temples or buildings used as temples could be multifunctional. Could be multifunctional. Actually, I have monkeys moving <laughs> everywhere. It's good. Well, we are just having information and looking at the monkeys. It's nice. But well, multifunctional and residences. Okay. But what is different? What is different between them? First. One building that was used as a residence was built in just one time or one stage of construction. And when we talk about a building that used to be a temple, had many stages of construction. These stages of construction were made depending on the kings they had. Every king used to modify part of the building or completely one whole building by all the walls. So what I mean is that they used to cover one building with a new one. Okay? So well, let's look at the monkeys before they are gone. <laughs> one monkey's name is Abel. The other monkey's name is Emily. And Magda. Diego is not there. Diego is out here. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
one day for you, you. Oh, day two for you. Okay. It's raining, but we could get confused with raining. Okay, so ready for information again? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So, well, so we were talking about this. One stage of construction and multiple stages of construction. It makes that what could be, which buildings was were possible to restore. One building that had one stage of construction was found completely damaged. It is not possible to restore it because we have not evidences about how it looks like during the ancient times. At least that we had a picture, but Mayas have no pictures, right? They never paint the residents on a wall of another. They never did it. But if we look back at that building, but we are going to see, as there were many kings during the times of this city, some of the kings decided to work on them, and that's what they were, they were doing, covering one with a new one, another, and something like always like this. So that's why something that we could find, if we have a big axe, and we cut exactly in the middle, you're going to find something similar as liars. Okay? But, an example that I used to explain this one, or these buildings, are the onions. I just compare them with onions. Here is an onion. What happened with the onion? Liars. But what happened with your onion after you leave it for a week at your kitchen and you don't eat it? What happened with the last liar? Turn yeah. Yes, but if you want to eat it, you could eat it, but you need to peel it. Same thing here. This building was found as a mound, but to restore it, what Archaeolists had to do is they had to come, they had to remove all the dirt and rocks that were or was the last stage of construction that was completely damaged because you don't, you don't need it. It don't help you for anything, and the substructure you find, that substructure preserves 30, 40, or sometimes 50 percent of the original walls. And that could be enough to know how it looks like. That's how it is possible to give it that shape with the tiers, with the stairs. You can see how the corners look where, right, rounded or square and all the designs that each tier had. But even there were some rocks that were missed that we can't see there. These rocks that were missed is are specifically in part of the tier where you just see rounded rocks. Because all the rounded rocks were covered with square rocks. So those square rocks just fell off, were not there were during restoration, so that's why archaeologists never rebuilt. They never pick up a rock from different place used to place there. They never do it. So that's why we are talking about, build, about a building. One building that is around probably 75 or 80 percent restored and original. It has probably like 40 percent of 35 percent of restoration, 35, 40 percent of, of, of the original walls. But the rest is something that is totally missed. And we are talking about the temple that used to be at the top. It's not there anymore. Decoration of the walls. All rocks were covered with a stucco. Stucco is missed. We can't see it anymore. It's impossible to add it there. We don't know which were the designs that the stucco were forming when they placed them to the, to the walls. So that's why it's impossible to know it. But well, even the restoration, Something that Achilles found is in some of the buildings reminds of the stucco, little pieces of the stucco, sometimes little points. And even this stucco was still preserving the color that they added. Walking by all the area, as they were digging or they were excavating, it was possible to find reminds of pottery. And by the pottery, it is possible to do the carbon dating and to know when Mayas lived here. That's why this archaeological site is dated between 250 BC to 1200 AD. 
it shows a lot of activity that makes makes the explainer time between three and seven hundred in so is when we know that there was a lot of activity when all these buildings are created, <coughs> when they left all these buildings, and then after seven, 700 AD, they started climbing. They were going down. Until 1200 AD, when this was totally abandoned. Okay, so that's why during so many years, a little bit more than 800 years, this was empty. And that's the reason why vegetation covered it. Okay? But, which was the purpose? They were worshipping gods. But the reason why I told you multifunctional is because, for example, this is the first temple that we, are used, we have seen in this moment. If you, you probably surround it. I don't know if you did it. But you could see that it has the steps at all sides. Mm -hmm. Right? The other buildings we're going to find are totally different. Those buildings have steps in only one side. Just one side. Multifunctional, only one purpose. The alignment they did has to be perfect. I'm not, I'm not talking about walls. They never aligned the walls. Because if we see, if you stand in one of the corners with your compass, you're going to find, specifically in this one, that it has some 10 degrees of difference south. This is east-west, 10 degrees south. So that's the, the error that it has. Hmm. But exactly the top, and another building at the top, they have to be aligned. The use of re observations and references for observations, and this helped them to be planning all their daily activities they had to be doing. Because probably you have heard about calendars before. Mm -hmm. The Mayan calendar became to be very famous, but we never known that not all the cities used them. So that's why this is not talking about all the Mayan cities we had during the ancient times among the five countries. We have so many cities, big kingdoms, big hegemonies, that they didn't use them, and the only thing they had to do is align in their buildings to be planning all their activities. Right? Why we need a calendar? To plan all our activities, right? To say, I work Monday to Friday, Saturday, I do something, an activity, probably Sunday, I go to the church, everything like that. Or, for example, November 19th is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. To be planning when, when we are going to make a party or a celebration. Is that right? Holidays, for example, we mark them in our calendar. Maya do this. But these holidays were a little bit different than us. It depends when special events were happening with the celestial bodies. Like an eclipse, for example, full moon. They known when full moons were coming because they known all their cycles, all the cycles of them. So that's why these were used even as observatories. Okay? We don't know which gods or which deities they were worshipping here because we have no evidences. No evidences, not enough evidences that support which gods they were worshipping. But what we know is according to the position it has. This is the west side of this complex. A complex that is known as a central complex. Only for rituals, celebrations, human sacrifices, and few people could be living here. The only people were allowed to be living here were priests and kings. Use that. The rest of the people had their complexes, residential complexes, a little bit distance, a distance from here. And among the complexes, there were the crops. The crops where they were producing food. So that's where we could find that between one complex and another, there used to be a connection, and this connection was a road. The road is used to be elevated. So that's why this first walking we had, that path where we were walking, is simulating representing one of the Mayan roads. That was the elevation that they had over the ground, used to avoid that they were flooded during rainy season. Okay? But well, any questions so far? No? Ready to keep walking? Yeah. We're going to walk by this direction. So well, let's go.
September and October is the worst, are the worst months for rainy season. Mm. Because we, 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 we have the risk of yeah. storms and hurricanes. Yeah. That one yeah. usually keeps on us that in this port. Yeah. We are used to going to different places where they have not the risk. What are they? It's like a little animal. It's, 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 it's part of the what do you say? The rodents. Oh. It's a rodent. Look. It's a family. <laughs> to the east se section of the complex where we could see something <coughs> different. As you see, the first building is by the ground level. This is elevated. Mm -hmm. And over this big basement, we could find two temples. Two temples, one is almost same dimensions of the first one. It's really tall. The tallest here works as a reference for the observations they made from that building. But the celebration they made with this observation was specifically in front of that temple. So that's why the, the celebration they made there were related with agriculture. Marking a date of March 23rd, when it happens is that the sun rises exactly by the center part of that building and Everybody must be meeting there to celebrate that moment because after that day everybody has to be back or has to go back to their fields to start working and doing the first activity of agriculture that we know as a slash and borrow. But well, so we use market as this. Public space down here and private space. Private activities. They propose to raise this at this height is to protect the view to that area so you could be walking <coughs> here in case that you were part of the public space and you couldn't see in case that they were doing a private celebration. The Mayas were smart. We say that they have good technologies but we couldn't say it at all. Something that they never could make is a perfect vertical wall. They never could make a vertical wall. It was not part of their knowledge. Here's the reason that's why everything they built had to be used as a premise. Because everything is supporting each other. It is something similar as a typing. Why is it possible to make a perfect vertical wall? It's false. If you have not columns, right? All the columns are making this structure and make these stairs strong, stays strong. But as Mayas had not columns, they didn't use them. That's the reason why they made a foundation, like a pyramid, the end was flat, where they make a room. They had vertical walls, but just to keep them vertical, they had to be like this wide. Then, what even was helping to support that wall, was the roof. The roof was something like this and the roof was held by a keystone. If you move the keystone, if you see, keystone is working hard. Keystone is helping to support the roof and at the same time support the wall. If you miss the keystone, roof collapse and the, if the roof collapse, even brings part of the wall. It is the reason why many times during restoration it is possible to find just something like this tile of the wall or, or what used to be the wall. In some places that is possible to find remains of the temple is because probably they made 
they were made in a different period of time, so they are younger than some older, <coughs> older cities, and even there was another system that some cities used to help or to prevent that these roofs and the walls collapse. First, walls were always similar than every place, but what they changed were their roof. They had wood lintels in the entrances, they had the roof like this, tensioners, wooden tensioners that helps to protect it, and the keystone. So if you move, miss your keystone, the roof will stay there because tensioners are working. So that's why some places it's possible to restore and to find that here are still preserving reminds of what used to be the temple. But here, they have not that technology. So that's why all their temples collapse. The only thing we find is the foundation, or the base of what used to be the temple. But, I'm going to show you something as buildings used to be before during the ancient times. In this moment, we use casting rocks. During the ancient times, this is not nice. This is just the beginning of a construction. Just to, to say that one construction is totally finished is because they added what right now is missed, decoration, stucco. So remember, archaeology used to try to restore something the closest possible to the original. But, right here, we have a building that is exactly as all the buildings that we have been exploring at this moment. But, by evidences of the stock of found in some places, and because there are some archaeological sites where we could find almost complete walls covered with a stucco. And this makes that our historians make a reconstruction to give us something as they used to be during the ancient times. It is exactly as we think that they were, by evidences found. We could support it. How can we support it? Because here it's possible to find a wall completely covered with stucco, and as you see, even it is preserving a mural. This mural has so many symbols. To decipher the symbols it has, it's important to make a, even a reconstruction. And clearly, by techniques that our historians have, is as we know, or is as they could make this reconstruction and decipher these symbols. And this helps to make theories. So you know that all theories are coming from murals, hieroglyphs, and information that is possible to find. But well, one building that is possible to find after climbing is this. As you can see, it has not a temple. Right? But with the reconstruction, the <coughs> temple is there. Can you see it? temple is there. Look how colorful it was, especially red. One of the colors that usually Mayas used was red and blue. The blue is something that, for example, that first, that other picture that I show you looks more blue than another color, right? So blue and red was one of the colors that basically they used to paint everything, but more than red. What is representing all this? Stucco, red color, square rocks, rounded rocks. What is represented? What do you think? Corn? Not it. Probably their color could be representing one of the colors of the corn because even they, ha they have blue corn, represented by the blue, yellow, right? The green. But what else? First, something that they try to do. They try to do everything or the perfect building. How? In their belief they had, they believed that human beings were created with corn by the gods. So the part or the process as they created was starting with bones, right? Bones that were covered with meat and muscles. Muscles covered with the skin. How do you human being formed? Then 
they added the blood, that the blood is representing the life or the spirit. That for the Mayas was seen as an energy, an energy that they known as Kulil. Right? But well, it is possible to find all this part of the body here, around the rocks, representing bones. A square rocks, meat and muscles. A stucco, skin, red color, blood. It is an imitation of the human being creation. But this is what they tried to do. And all the process was exactly like this. In this order. But well, questions so far? Blue? No, blue is, is, is blue, I mean, building. The blue color, it was representing even an energy that is related with the water, right, from the heaven, but even it's possible to find it in the underworld. There's something that something the Maya saw in different worlds, and something that they found just in only one world and another world. What happened, for example, when you die, where do you go? Where do you go when you die? Where do your spirit go? Heaven or underworld? For the Mayas, it was the underworld. The underworld was the world of darkness, but not exactly as the hell. It was the world of the dead. Everything related with death was exactly there. Okay? Well, well, right now we are just almost finishing our time. Uh, we're going to have, or we're going to be exploring here. We will have around 10 15 minutes to explore it. Then we're going to meet everybody together here to walk back to the service area, load our transportations, and travel to the village. We're going to have our lunch and then. Okay. here because this is where we usually start uh, giving information about this this property 
something that I would like to show you. Right now we are in what this is, we is a property. A property here is is a little bit big, and always we just divide what is our property with fences. These fences were rocks that were found here, rocks that we collected from our backyard to use them as a fence. But we have this is a, a modern fence. It has mortar. It has cement that stick the rocks. But if you would like to know how is one traditional fence, it's exactly as is there. No mortar. Just one rock over another one. If you pull it, all the rocks okay. fall off. Okay. So that's why here, what we are going to see is that we like so many trees. We like the shape. So many trees and the shape help to give us good climate in our house. So that's the reason why we have no air conditioning. And even the other reason is that if you have a house with stick of wood walls and thatch roof, this is more comfortable than staying in a house that is made with blocks and cement. Unless that you have air conditioning, you could be surviving there. But if you have no air conditioning, that house that is very strong, during the day it gets hit by the sun, and during the night when the breezes stop, it feels as an oven. So that's why usually there's people that don't like these houses, and just make houses with wood walls, wooden walls, and thatch roof. But even you could find families that have both houses. A strong house, and a house with wood. Why? But one is in case of hurricanes. One is the house that we use in the winter. That for us is very cold. For winter is really cold. Two days ago we were around 16 Celsius, something like probably 68 Fahrenheit, right? And so we were cold. And that's the reason why we need these houses, because as I told you, wall, uh, the the, st the blocks and cement houses they get a little bit hot, so they get warmer than a wooden house. Mm -hmm. But during the summer, we use the wooden house because it's where we sleep and we hang our hammocks to be staying there. But well, trees that we could find here, basically, we could find trees as this. This is a, these are orange trees. This tree, three trees here in this area are oranges. We're gonna see some other orange trees that has oranges. For oranges, never, never turn orange. Always oranges stays green and with yellow spots. That is what when we say, oh, it's time to enjoy that orange. Because if we wait until they get ripe, they could turn yellow. But if they turn yellow, it is because probably a bird made it a hole. So that's why we don't like it. Even we used to, before many years ago, we used to grow this plant that is a, is an, an orchid. This vanilla orchid, but this vanilla orchid is very special. Nowadays we have a problem with some insects, as nowadays more population is demanding more food, and nowadays the global warming is changing everything. So that's why what people nowadays there is a lot of people is doing using pesticides to be controlling their crops, and according to this, you're killing some insects that are very important. And we have some kind of bees, not African bees. These are, we know them as meliponas. Kind of bees that are the only bees that could be working in the pollination of these flowers. Just them. If we have not these melipona bees, they couldn't be pollinated, so you can produce the vanilla. Unless that you do it by hand. But one, is one of the other problems is that you need to be exactly look in the moment that the vanilla is blooming because the flower is fertile just around two three hours in a day in the morning eight in the morning to eleven in the morning flowers are fertile if you wait later you can do the pollination anymore and the, the flower will close so you won't have vanilla so that's why it is one of the reasons why many people use <coughs> plant them as decoration of their plants of the trees, they look nice when they are blooming. Looks nice, right? So that's why it's beautiful. We like flowers. We like colorful colors. That's the reason why even we use bougainvilleas. In this moment, they are not blooming, but when bougainvilleas are blooming, you will have flowers in different colors. 
like pink, orange, purple, red, all these colors you could find there. And if we focus on these other plants, what is attract attractive? Leaves. If you see a flower, it has not a flower. It has very, very small flower. So what makes this plant beautiful is the color mm -hmm. that the leaves has. Because it's a mix of many different colors. So that's what we like it. But well, another plant, another tree that even is very important is this huge one that it is somebody know it? Mango. This is a mango tree. Wow. This big one. Yeah. This one. A mango tree. There are different varieties of mango. Some small ones, different colors. For me, but the favorite mango is one that grows like this big and turn part of the skin pink. So that for me is the best one. I like it, sweet. There are some other that are sweet, but when you eat it, it has a lot of fibers that get in your teeth. So that other, that is the pink one, it's smooth, you eat it, no problem. Right? So that's why for me it's, it's the best. But even we have another, that is where the bicycle is. That tree probably you don't know it. You probably know it. It's in the family of the chewing gum. The chewing gum is a tree and the sap is what we produce to make chewing gum. The chewing when you buy, that chewing gum you are using, that we use to refresh your mouth, is coming from the sap of a tree that we have it in the jungle. So that's why it's, it's in the same family. Because if you cut the bark, you will you will get sap. But what happened is that the fruit is bigger. This fruit is like this big. We know it as the, the chewing gum. We know it as sapote, and this is mamey. It's a big one. Have you heard about mamey? Mamey is so delicious. The only problem is that you need to wait until it gets totally ripe. But but it doesn't matter if it gets totally ripe. But when you're eating it, it is sticky to your lips. Get stuck. If you made it in water or whatever, you blend it with mixed with milk. Even you will drink it, and your lips are sticky. <laughs> but that sap is good for digestion, right? It's good for digestion, so it helps for the digestion process. But well, let's continue walking this way. more that we're gonna find same tree everywhere <laughs> another tree that is very important and I'm sure that you like you love that fruit you love that fruit to eat it with chips avocado here there is the avocado this, our tree too. <laughs> this is our avocado avocado is very delicious you know do you know what is different with an avocado and with a mango that the mangoes an example if we have 400 mangoes on that tree we can eat them all the mango season stays for around three months but at the second week that we are eating mangoes and drinking water with, ma with mangoes just imagine we get sick we don't want to see them we don't want to smell them, <laughs> right? we don't want to eat them, we don't want anything. When people is passing by your house and ask you for mangoes, sometimes we say them. We pay you, but get them all away from here, <laughs> right? Because we don't want them. But with avocados, we're always protecting them. We don't want they fell off. If they fell off, you will have your guacamole ready there. <laughs> you want to eat it, you need to come with your chips. Right? <laughs> but the avocado, one of the problems is that if you wait, they get ripe on the tree, it's a lot, and get guacamole. Okay. But we need to wait because the skin always is turning in different colors. Mm -hmm.
when it's totally bright, it's not ready yet. When it meets the brightness, is when it's getting it's close to be ripe. So when we know that it has like three days before it gets ripe, is when we we have a very large stick of wood with something that like a hand, we grab it and take it, and then we just keep it in our in our kitchen, and we wait until it gets ripe. So every day, at every uh, meal, we could be eating avocados. Yeah. Sometimes with the slices, sometimes by guacamole, sometimes we make a sauce. There are different ways to eat it. And just sometimes with some salty cookies. That is very delicious. Right? Mm -hmm. well, avocado. Then, look the orange. Can you see this? That little orange? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. There's one that is. Can you see that one? A little bit <coughs> more on the right side. It's, yeah. it's a little bit yellow, but it has a hole made by a bird. Right? Um, then there is another one. This one. But this one, even is right in the back. That, that little plant that you can see that some branches were cut, that looks that it has a white bark. Mm -hmm. It is a nice plant. I will try to get it to give you focus on the leaves. And I'm sure that some, most of you know what this is. Somebody missed this? No. No? Yours? <laughs> Save the odor because you're gonna smell something else, something different. Yeah. Very soft. Oh, okay, don't worry. What do you smell here? Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Oh, that's what it is. Magda, spice. You're gonna make tortillas for everybody here today. <laughs> all spice. All spice. That's why it smells like all. You smell everything here. Clove, mint, cinnamon, whatever. Yeah. It is that is the reason why this all spice. So all spice, even is an important plant that all the time we have it, we grow it. This is from this house. That is from another house. <coughs> why is important? Leaf, the leaf, the green leaf, exactly like this. Let's do cut. You could make a tea with this, and it helps our problems to sleep. Stress. Problems that make us make us to be rolling by the bed, and we can't catch the the slip. So that's why it helps us. We just wake up, take a couple lifts, boil the water, take the water out, stir the lifts, wait. The water will be torn in a little bit green and drink it. <coughs> a few minutes, you feel that you were walking by probably three hours under a very sunny day, so tired <coughs> that you will be sleeping. <laughs> right? right? And it's natural and organic. The fruit it has, we just use it as a black pepper that we use to spice our food, right? To add it and marinate specifically beef and some kind of meat like pork. Look well. Let's walk this other way. Smell it when I cut it. <laughs> I'm sure you know. Cinnamon. Um, uh, no offense. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon. 
Oh, back to what I cut. There are different varieties of cinnamon. This is one of that grows in the tropics. This kind of heat we have. And the part of the cinnamon we use is the bark. Mm -hmm. The bark is what we have to be peeling. If you peel it, one part, <coughs> it, the bark connects again. Right. Then another one. It doesn't have the tree. Yep. So that's why the bark is something. It's a process that we have to do similar as coffee. We just keep the the bark in a plastic or something under the sun during so many days until it gets totally dry. And then when it gets totally dry, you could oven it to help it a little bit, but specifically it's more with the sun. Then you will have the complete pieces because they will be like cold, mm -hmm. right? And you could ground it to add a flavor to your desserts, right? But well, it is here. And even we grow cinnamon. <laughs> but if you look at that side, that last fruit, the green fruit you see. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. What is that? Do you see do you know what is this? No. no like No rambutan. Um, it looks like rambutan, but it's no rambutan. Well, this is not ready yet. It must be totally brown, as you can see some something there. And naturally, the sun made them open. But we have to harvest them before they are open. Because what we need are the seeds are in. So the name of this is achiote. Some people know it as anato. Anato seeds. If I open it, I don't know if there are, there are seeds yet. Yeah, there are. We could find this kind of seeds. Do you see them? Red, some red seeds. But this is not ready yet. So that's why the color is not exactly red. The flavor, <coughs> is, it has not like one specific flavor. But it's an important ingredient that we use to give color to the food. Oh, some places add color to the food. Usually we could use dry peppers. So the dry peppers make us paint our food. For example, mole. Mm -hmm. The mole is made with a lot of so many dry peppers that give the color. Another that is adobo. So similar than mole, but different flavor. Even its color is painted with dry peppers. But in Yucatan, basically we use achiote. Sometimes we mix it with a little bit of the juice of the peppers, of the we blender the peppers and mix it with this to add it a different flavor. But the Yucatan is just this. We mix it with one important ingredient that is impossible to imitate it, and this is what makes it special in Mayan food. This ingredient is an, a kind of orange, sour orange, sour orange that we could use instead of vinegar or water. Because you could add it water, mix it with garlic, and marinate your chicken, and then cook it. It will be tasting delicious. But it's more delicious when you use the sour orange. So that's the trick in the Mayan dishes. Okay, next time you're gonna eat today this dish, and you're gonna feel probably a little bit something like this of the sour orange that could be there. But well, chayote, achiote, sorry. Achiote. Coconuts. This is the green. We have the yellow and we have the orange. Three colors of coconuts. We have bananas. Always you're gonna see that people have bananas everywhere in all properties. Why do you think it's important? I know you know it. <laughs> what do you think that is important? We use it in cooking. We use it in cooking. Yeah. Something 
Pastel. That you could find in Mexico, specifically in the month of November. Tamales. Tamales. We made tamales with this. Just to make the tamales, we have to cut the lid like it will be perfect, like that one. We pass it by the fire in both sides to make it softer, mm -hmm. imitating something as a plastic that we could fold the tamale easier. Mm -hmm. If you just fold it like this, this gets cracked, no, 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 and that's why <coughs> your food is getting out. But if you just pass it by fire, just like this, fast. You can see the consistency is going to change, it's going to taste. Something feeling similar as a plastic. And this is what we use to, to fold the tamales. So that's why you will see tamales today. We just use it once. Once that we cook it, this is waste. But it is organic, so that's what is not exactly waste. We just put, put it somewhere by, by our, our, our plants and it helps to fertilize, right? So this is the tamales. The fruits, the bananas, well, we eat them. Even we have plantain, the plantain we use to fry them, we could eat it with eggs or many different ways. So let's go this way. What happens when you live in a village, in a village like here, and the main activity is that helps in your incomes is working at the hills working in the jungle. What could be the problems you could get at the jungle or at your fields? Insects. Insects. Insect bites. Sunburn. Sunburn. Mm -hmm. So in some plants that are toxic. So by these plants that are toxic we have remedies. Remedies that we have since the ancient times for ancient people, Mayas, had a lot of knowledge about medicine but medicine that is local. When the Spaniards came here with new disease, they couldn't control them with their medicines they had. Their knowledge was not enough after the Spaniards came. But one of these remedies for all these problems oh, is the aloe vera. Mosquito bites, sunburns, <coughs> in case that we have or we touch a plant so closely because the resin of some plants or sometimes some plants have some kind of little hair that if you use past it, it burns. So this is the remedy. But, pineapples. Pineapples! Everybody like pineapples? Yes. Pineapples are not native from here. We don't... Mayas never got them. <laughs> Mayas never used them. So that's why in Maya language there is not a word for pineapple. Mm. If you use piña. That's in Spanish. But look at here. There are some pineapples. It blooms a flower exactly in the center. This is where the fruit comes out, produced, and grows like this. The time it takes is around one year. It depends how fertile is the soil. But something important: if you buy a pineapple, cut the crown, take the crown and plant it, you will have to wait two years or more than two years. So the trick here is that once that you harvest your pineapple, as you see, these looks that were cut, they harvest pineapple here, but after they harvest, they cut with a machete all the leaves to make that these little plants start growing from the bottom. These are the plants that they need. Once that they have are big enough, they just cut them, remove this one, and plant it there. So it is the process to harvest the pineapples. So that's why these are the best. Not the crowns. They take less time than the crowns. Because this takes too long. No. That's what was in a late moment. It's going to bloom, I don't know when. But it depends on the size. This is close to start blooming. This one, probably in one month it must be blooming because the time that they need is one year and they start blooming after probably four or five months they were planted. There is no one special season to grow them. Depending. Because okay. I have one that's about that size and hasn't bloomed. Hasn't bloomed because probably it's not the climate or the weather they need. Or it's not exactly where sun is directly. They need sun. They, they can't be resisting a lot of water. Rain 
is a good moment for them. If you have rain, you will not harvest. As well, this is part of the pineapples. If we look back here, exactly here and there, this is the sour orange. This, this fruit, this orange that you can see here. This one and that one. But well, are you ready for lunch? Yeah. Did I tell you? Where was she? Oh, where there she is. I didn't tell you. I saw you. I saw you. <laughs> right now, in this moment, bathrooms are exactly here at the bottom with the brown table, the, with the brown doors. By the right side, we have to wash our hands. After washing the hands, we just came or we just come to the kitchen where Magda will do the rest of, of the tour. She will explain us about the kitchen and something that even you're going to do today. Handmade tortillas. You will do them. Cool. Okay? This is something that you will have to do. Something that you learned to do how we made them. And you will eat this tortilla. Just one. Then they are making more for you. Okay, everyone. So first, we're gonna start um, passing by groups of uh, nine, okay? Because uh, we need a flat surface for to do the tortilla, okay? A uh, process how to make the uh, the masa or the wa or the tur uh, for the, the dough for the tortilla is that first uh, it this is white corn, okay? So we actually for uh, approximately. 10 pounds of um, corn, we have to put a pot of hot water to get the water hot. Okay, so when the water is hot, we put the corn. Then we wait, uh, after that, we put like three to uh, four spoons of uh, what is the uh, quick light so that the, the, the actually the corn will start peeling up. It has to peel up and it has to get soft so that you can process the corn or take it to a meal or even you can do it yourself in one of those. I used to use one of those when I was smaller because I used to make tortillas as well. So I learned to do tortillas when I was 11 years old by hand, not like this one that Miss Adela does. This is Miss Adela. She is going to be teaching you uh, how to do a corn tortilla. We have over there Julia. Hello. And we have Conchi right there, uh, uh, she's actually helping uh, Miss Juliana to um, do some tortillas, okay? Uh, we have over there Miss Victoria and uh, Miss uh, Orchidia, we have Orchidia over there, and uh, <laughs> uh, Miss Felipa. So, um, first, uh, she is gonna show you how to do, um, how to make one, and in the same way she makes, you can go ahead and do your one. It doesn't have to be perfect. Once you do, she can fix it for you. <laughs> then afterwards, you can take it to Miss Juliana to put it on the fire pit. Okay? How many of you are ready? So first of all, what she does is turn to with the left hand side, and with the other hand she uh, makes it uh, to put uh, uh, to do it wrong. Okay, one with one hand she turns, and with the other one she uh, rounds it up. She does that in uh, like approximately four seconds. <laughs> She is a very expert because she had to grow up a big family, so um, she actually had to do this like two times per day, every day, so um, she has a bachelor's degree. The fire pit and has a little bit of cilantro, okay? There is no pepper. There's no pepper in this one. So after you have your tortilla, when I have this ready, you can put on some of these. <laughs> 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 
And you can taste it. It's for you to taste, okay? This is pumpkin seeds. Yeah. This is not spicy. This is for you to taste only with the tortilla. If you're ready, you can go ahead and put a little bit on, on your tortilla, make a, a sort of a taco, roll it, and uh, you can taste. Remember, take care of your tortilla. Uh, here, 
um, these spices are what is inside the chicken actually. So all these spices, we have this one that they were talking about the uh, allspice. So this is what the allspice tree grows actually. We have cloves over here. Uh, we have cloves over here. We have a cinnamon. We had you saw the cinnamon tree right there. Uh, we have the garlic. We have the garlic plant right there as well. So every little thing that you see here is what you are actually going to have here. We have some oranges, which are the uh, sour orange. Uh, the um, the brown, the purple onion, which is that you're going to be having in your empanada, actually. And um, all the vegetables here.
This spring home is more than 800 years old and it was developed by the culture known as Totonaki or Totonaka. They were established in the Gulf of Mexico area, what we know now today as the state of Veracruz. Este ritual tiene más de 800 años de antigüedad y fue desarrollado por la cultura que se le conoce como Totonacu o Totonaca. Ellos estaban establecidos en el área del Golfo de México, lo que hoy conocemos como el estado de Veracruz. Right now, the flyers are climbing a height of 75 feet tall, that is 35 meters. And I would like to add that none of them is using any type of safety net, any cables or harnesses. So ladies and gentlemen, these bird men are literally risking their lives right now. En este momento, los voladores están escalando a una altura de 75 pies, esos son 25 metros. Y cabe mencionar que ninguno de ellos está utilizando ningún tipo de red de seguridad, ningún cable o arnés. Así es que, damas y caballeros, estos hombres pájaros están literalmente arriesgando sus vidas en este preciso momento. The Totonaco people were very good farmers, very good in the field, but they also developed very well their skills in mathematics and astronomy. In fact, they generated their own calendar, which was based in 13 months of 28 days each month. That calendar is until today more accurate than the one that we use. Los Totonacú fueron muy buenos agricultores, muy buenos en el campo, pero también desarrollaron muy bien sus habilidades en las matemáticas y la astronomía. De hecho, ellos generaron su propio calendario, que estaba basado en tres meses de 18 días cada mes. Ese calendario es, hasta el día de hoy, más preciso del que manejamos nosotros actualmente. Y es por eso que nosotros tenemos los años bisiestos. Cada cuatro años, un día extra en febrero, por no hacer bien los cálculos y no escuchar a los expertos. And that's why we have the leap years. Every four years, one extra day in February. It's just miscalculation, guys. That's all. Toy, you can take it home with you as a very special and unique souvenir for all your friends and family directly from Mexico. Directly from Costa Maya, Mahawal. Damas, presten mucha atención porque esta es información muy importante, ya que estos chicos, aparte de guapísimos e intrépidos voladores, también son excelentes artesanos. Ellos fabrican esta pequeña réplica del ritual original. Este pequeño juguete se lo pueden llevar todos ustedes como un souvenir bastante único y especial para todos sus familiares y amigos directamente desde México, desde Costa Maya, Mahahual. Eso, damas y caballeros, es lo que vamos a estar viendo en este